thought we had to refresh it and, and change it. And so um, hopefully by the end of today, you'll kind of understand uh, what changes are there and why we uh, made them. Next slide. Um, just by way of history, uh, I want to comment on uh, why CMQCC uh, first of all exists in the first place and then got into dealing with hemorrhage. Um, yeah, Audrey, my I'm, slide didn't I, change. Yeah, it's because mine is not doing anything. <laughs> so, oh. Valerie, can I get, can we give this back to you and let you run the slides because it's not working on mine for some reason. There you go, Perfect. David. You should be set. Yeah, there you go. Thank Thanks, you. Val. So, um, as you can see this in this curve, um, this is uh, a plot of the California maternal mortality. And what you can see is uh, we did pretty well, uh, but it bottomed out, uh, you know, it bottomed out in the uh, 90s and early 2000 years and then began an abrupt climb uh, that, that uh, you know, the state took notice of and leaders. And so uh, they formed the CMQCC, the, the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative, to address this particular uh, problem. And, um, and uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, while we'd love to take all the credit for the, the downturn that, that appears to be happening towards the end of the curve, um, there's probably a number of factors that lead into that, but it is encouraging that it's beginning to come down. So hopefully some of the things we've done with, with our toolkits is beginning to impact things. Next slide. Um, the other big charge to CMQCC is to deal with the data that you see on this slide or, or um, actually, uh, <laughs> you, you know what? Um, yeah, let's skip past this. I'm going to skip a couple slides, Valerie. Yeah, on this slide you see the racial disparity in maternal mortality. Like a lot of other uh, uh, particular measures, um, African American populations tend to have a much higher rate of uh, poor outcomes. And you can see here an almost three to four fold increased risk, which uh, compared to the other groups, uh, is definitely uh, well above what we want it to be. Next slide. Um, and it, 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 similar pattern holds for uh, age groups. And uh, if you look again, uh, as you may or may not know, by national data, it's the 35 and above group uh, over the last few years that has uh, increased in, in numbers as far as a percentage of delivery. So the, the sort of bottom line is that group uh, also, particularly when you get above 40, has, has a pretty significant problem. Well, just Next give it slide. to me and I'll put it in. Next slide, please. Yeah, perfect. So on the national level, um, the National Partnership for Maternal Safety made up of some 17 organizations which uh, uh, represent a, a, a wide range of providers, facilities, uh, public uh, health, uh, consumer groups interested in maternal data um, have, have formed uh, and are putting together these national bundles, uh, in, including uh, hemorrhage, preeclampsia, uh, venous thromboembolism. They're, they're about to, uh, they formed a group on primary cesarean section. So they're putting the, they got a funding through uh, the federal government to, to help uh, put these with the idea is to put these safety bundles in every uh, delivery setting uh, across the nation. Next slide. Now, uh, obstetrical hemorrhage, as we'll talk about, got picked first. Uh, the bundles, by the way, are divided up by the, what I call the four R's, readiness, recognition, response, and reporting slash uh, systems learning, uh, and, and uh, the change concepts are, are put into those four categories. Uh, and uh, the, the, the sort of bottom line is with hemorrhage, it's really to address the, the, the dreaded uh, complications of denial and delay. Next slide. 
So with respect to these bundles, if you look at it, uh, every unit ought to have these things to be ready. Uh, hemorrhage cart, uh, rapid uh, access to uh, the medications, uh, response uh, team, uh, and, and establishing what's going to be done for that, as well as having uh, massive transfusion protocols and O negative uh, blood Im or uh, immediately available blood uh, in everywhere. Under recognition, it gets into assessment of hemorrhage risk, uh, measurement of cumulative blood loss, i.e., how much blood have we lost since the beginning of this case in total, not just during the delivery, et cetera, uh, and uh, active management of third stage. Next slide. The response, of course, and, and that's what we're going to talk a lot about today, is having a unit standard uh, stage-based uh, OV uh, hemorrhage emergency management plan. The idea behind uh, uh, this is to, is to have a response much like you have a code blue in, in the to, to respond to, to, to cardiac arrest so that there's a standardized response that you can teach and improve and, and things of that nature. And then also to have a support program for patients, uh, families, uh, et cetera, that, that standardize. Under reporting, it's to uh, uh, establish a culture of huddles or, or system learning after events, uh, including uh, 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 debriefs, and uh, to review um, all the uh, stage three hemorrhage and obviously uh, monitor, the, monitor your outcomes and process uh, metrics. Next slide. Now, why do we need all of this? Um, well, um, we know the incidence of obstetric hemorrhage is increasing. Um, that's a lecture in itself, so I don't want to get into it, but obviously uh, the, the, we're paying the price somewhat from the high C-section rate, uh, older moms, uh, people's uh, BMI being elevated, et cetera. There are a number of factors that potentially could go into that. Um, but I would say that the, the other important thing is, especially why hemorrhage got chosen first, is there's such a high a number, when you review the deaths by maternal hemorrhage, such a high number of preventable events. In other words, you could have done something uh, to prevent that. And um, we have some data coming up, so I'll stop at that. But th it's very important to keep that concept. And then uh, when you look at the breakdown, there's a lot of points uh, that happen, whether it's uh, provider issues or facility issues. So. Developing a toolkit and planning is, is something that's very important. Next slide. So this is not new. Um, if you really look at it, Dr. Berg's work uh, that was published, uh, it, you know, uh, many uh, or, you know, five years ago uh, pointed out, uh, A, the incidence of hemorrhage being relatively high and as well as, uh, you know, the preventability being high. Next slide. Now, in California, we've, um, it, you know, through the uh, uh, mortality uh, of pregnancy-related death uh, mortality reviews, we pretty much confirmed that. This paper uh, that Dr. Main and group just published uh, the data, and what you can see is essentially uh, what we talked about above, and, and that is the vast majority of cases to alter the outcome is, is strong to good that you could do something in, in about 70% and, and somewhat uh, that you could have made a change in 25%. And there's only 6% of cases in, in the California review that suggested that we couldn't uh, uh, do something. So bottom line is that uh, this is, uh, you know, an important task. Next slide. Now, one thing, when uh, they did their mortality review, uh, uh, the advisory committee, uh, the, this, the, uh, the thing that strikes people the most is not the numbers I just showed you. It's the stories. Next slide. So, for example, here was a 
24-year-old Gravita to Para-1 at 38 weeks who was induced because she was tired of being pregnant. Um, so she got a bunch of risk factors, some of which we didn't have to do. Um, and after eight hours of active phase, uh, two hours the second stage, she delivers this eight and a half or nearly eight and a half pound kid. Uh, and then she starts uterine acne. Uh, acne. And then, uh, so the nurse, you know, w wanting to not bother the physician because he was, 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 home, uh, it, you know, uh, she gets, uh, a, she get, gets uh, methogen, um, it responds pretty well, and then he leaves, and then 30 minutes later, she starts bleeding again, so uh, they, they give her another dose of the same medicine, uh, methogen. Um, after another 60 minutes, they called the MD, um, who uh, performed a DNC, and more methogen was given. Next slide. Uh, following 45 minutes later, another DNC was done. They're now up to about 2,000 cc's in, in, in blood loss, um, but they couldn't find the proper tubing, so they couldn't get the, the blood products going, so they gave crystalloid. Uh, by this point, her blood pressure uh, is now dropped and her pulse is way up. Uh, they decided to give her more methogen. Uh, and another DNC. Um, she's finally given a bit of blood, and uh, unfortunately, after uh, that, she arrested and uh, was taken to the ICU, but uh, passed away. Next slide. Um, here's another case. So, uh, post-date induction with Cervidil and oxytocin. Uh, 20 minutes after delivery, she. Uh, uh, improves on the, on the bleeding she had after the vacuum-assisted birth. Uh, the doc leaves the hospital. Uh, she continues to bleed. 35 minutes later, the doc comes in. Uh, they repeat the above twice in packing. Uh, they again delay in giving blood uh, uh, in anything else. The patient codes and after get and she when you looked at it, she only got. Uh, uh, it took two and a half hours before she got any blood at all. And of course, uh, this uh, patient didn't die immediately, but she went into the syndrome with multiple organ fa failure and anoxic brain injury and then died at day 14. So I think, next slide, I think the take home message on, on the, this is, is uh, backed up by survey of findings we did back in 08, where we saw that, patient, that hospitals didn't have a, a protocol for hemorrhage. There was inconsistent findings of who did what and when. 70% um, of hospitals had no drills or anything. Most had all the medications. A few had balloons, et cetera. Nice, uh, next slide. And so uh, we made a bunch of recommendations, uh, and, and again, I'm not going to go through them all, but basically because we're going to go uh, by uh, through that, um, but the bottom line was we wanted to reduce denial and delay. Uh, we, we learned that, you know, you have to do that by following how much blood is lost, not finding lab work or vital signs. Um, it needed to be a step-by-step -step plan, and we needed uh, a number of other tools uh, for everywhere and, uh, you know, avoid the uh, too little, too late syndrome uh, that's described in the two cases that we just uh, showed. And it, and it turned out that this was a good way to foster teamwork and get people working together. So it turned out it was a good thing. Next slide. So again, here, if you take those, here are the more specific. Uh, again, um, I, I'm sure most on the call have, have seen this list before, so I'm not going to read through it, uh, but the bottom line is those are uh, the things that uh, are uh, recommended. Next slide. Um, there is, uh, the other finding was uh, how do you, you know, what's postpartum hemorrhage? As you know, this is uh, been now uh, defined by the ACOG Revitalized Group as 
more than 1,000 cc's for either vaginal or C-section birth. But the, the group was very specific to point out that that's, the, that's what's the definition uh, for statistical purposes. It was very appropriate in, in obviously, in, in this case, in vaginal delivery, to define action before then. So while, while uh, it, you know, the two would have the same definition of what a postpartum hemorrhage was, the action or triggers for that did not have to be there. Uh, and uh, it turns out that if you use these and, and use 1,000 cc's, that's about 4 or 5% of the folks you de deliver all the time. So with that, I'm going to pass the, the ball back to uh, you, Audrey, and, and let you pick it up on, on physiology. All right. So can we have the next slide, please? So a couple of things, I'm sure most of you are quite familiar with this, but I think it's also helpful to go back to some of the basic physiology that we're dealing with here. So we'll just review a few um, cool things about maternal pregnancy and postpartum physiology, um, which is that there's quite a bit of blood volume, as you know. A uh, gravid woman has 60 kilograms, or about six liters, by 30 weeks of gestation. Her um, uterus becomes fairly heavy, 1,200 grams in the third trimester, up from starting in somewhere of the range of of under 100 grams. And the uterine capacity, this one's important, in the third trimester, you know, when she's not pregnant, it only holds 10 milliliters of volume. When, when she's having her baby and she's in the third trimester, the, the uterine cavity can hold 500 uh, mLs. So there's a great opportunity for concealed blood loss there. Um, the other really important piece is how much cardiac output a person has uh, right at the time of birth. Before pregnancy, cardiac output only, the uterus and its associated organs only account for about 2% of cardiac output, but in the third trimester, um, we're pumping a lot of blood through that circuit, uh, 600 to 800 milliliters per minute. Next slide, please. Audrey, this is Valerie. You said in the uterine cavity capacity was in the third trimester was 500 milliliters, or is 5, it 5,000? Okay. 5,000. So one of the things that's so critical for pregnancy is that women are quite resilient, and we often, uh, they may have a lot of changes going on before we recognize in overt ways that that they are getting into trouble. So we just quickly review the um, trauma assessment of blood loss. A, cl a class one ha hemorrhage, which is under 1,000 uh, milliliters, is a total deficit of 15% and um, usually results in orthostatic tachycardia. A 1,500 milliliter blood loss is a class two hemorrhage, and these people will have resting tachycardia and orthostatic hypotension. And it's not until um, you've lost about two and a half liters that you start to see, or between 1,500 and two and a half liters that you start to see overt um, vital signs changes that you may notice, like the resting hypotension and oliguria. And this is a, a point that people really, um, I think a lot of people know, but somehow in the clinical situation, often that, that people are looking for the hypotension to believe that the person has really lost a significant amount of blood, and that's an important thing that we need to keep working on, is remembering that it's not low blood pressure that, that is going to tell us. By the time we see that, she's already in trouble. Um, and by the time we've lost more than two and a half liters, a person may become obtunded and suffer from cardiovascular collapse. Next. So the really important thing about looking at quality improvement, as you all know, is that the way we can achieve the highest performance is by making it easy to do the right thing. So this means that we cannot continue our old ways of kind of blaming and training and making sure, well, if we just go over that detail again, people will get it right. Um, we have to make it easy for people to do what we want. Um, and we, this means we need to hardwire our changes into routine practice. Education is only the beginning. As all of you know, that we also need to have all of our systems lined up so that our order sets, our EMR, our protocol, our supplies, everything is working together to help the clinicians do um, recognize that something's going on and, and react to it. The other important thing, though, is that we know that all, all not all improvement um, is helpful improvement. So, I mean, not all change is a helpful improvement, and it's important that we 
take the iterative approach to quality improvement and the iterative approach to changing our practice when we uh, implement something like the hemorrhage bundle. We have to know the difference between change for change sake and change that's making care better, so it's important to build measurement into our processes. Next. So one of the things that we did this time around with the toolkit is we spent some time really talking to users and making sure that we could glean their lessons from the field. And so those are summarized here on this slide. And probably the most important one is that it really does take a broad team. Hemorrhage touches many, many parts of the hospital. Um, and responding effectively to hemorrhage means that we have to have all of our disparate teams working together and understanding what our goals are. So thinking about in most any setting, we need a minimum of obstetrics, nursing, anesthesia, blood bank, laboratory, operating pers room personnel, and other support personnel. And then of course in 2015, most people are on an electronic record, and so it becomes critical to integrate your electronic record team into your overall improvement team for hemorrhage as well. And there may be other unique providers in your setting if you're a small hospital or if you're a very big complex hospital, you may need to really be thinking about who else to bring on board. And of course, we have to have champions. Um, it's just much harder to do the work if we cannot identify champions in each of these areas who can really help move things forward because it takes time to make changes in our clinical environment as I'm sure all of you are well aware. Next, please. So just reviewing the um, Obstetric hemorrhage safety bundle is really just a list of items that every hospital needs to have in terms of readiness, recognition, response, and reporting. Where the obstetric hemorrhage toolkit can help you is with fleshing out the details of what goes into having each of those um, systems in place. Next. So a couple, again, from talking to our end users, uh, we wanted to point out that there's a few things that most people found to be quote unquote easy wins. And these were um, instituting a hemorrhage cart, which is a uh, similar to a crash cart in most settings, has um, all the supplies that are needed to effectively manage a hemorrhage um, that you can bring right to the bedside. Another thing that was an easy, and we'll show you some pictures of some hemorrhage carts a little bit later. Um, the other thing that has been an easy win in most settings uh, is active management or giving oxytocin at birth because a lot of people have been doing this for a very long time. So in many settings, that's not a big fight about um, how practice should go. A couple of other things that our end users have really emphasized as being essential, but they may take a little bit more time is instituting the risk assessment, which we'll go over in a minute, having a massive transfusion protocol for OB and for the hospital, um, other overall sort of protocol details, for example, um, deciding on a second line medication after oxytocin, and then replacing estimated blood loss with quantitative blood loss processes. Next. So when we talked about, uh, David talked earlier about the um, emergency management plan. And this is what uh, we mean by a staged response to an emergency management plan, is having all patients assessed in terms of their risk factors on admission and uh, reassessed throughout their stay, M making sure to take routine preventive measures for all births, and then um, having key indicators to understand when someone is bleeding, when we're moving from stage one to stage two and stage three, and having a set um, of guidelines as to how to respond in each situation. I do want to emphasize that one of the things we've clarified in the 2.0 toolkit is that at each of these points, decision points, you'll be looking at not only the blood volume, but also whether or not the bleeding is continued. So if she's lost uh, 1,500 mLs, but the bleeding has now stopped, then you do not need to move on to stage three interventions. You just need to monitor her very closely to make sure the bleeding doesn't resume. Um, so that's a point of clarification in the new toolkit. Next, please. These are just, we have, as you know, several different examples different ways of, to um, provide cognitive aids to people who like different displays of information. So these are just two other versions of the emergency management plan. And you should choose 
one that fits your setting, or many places have modified the graphic display of the emergency management plan to fit their own setting. Next. So we're going to go over a little bit of just the details. I know that many of you are familiar with some of this already, um, but we'll also try to highlight a few things that we've changed in the new toolkit. So stage O is really about being prepared, risk assessment on admission, active management of third stage, providing antepartum care and counseling to women who um, are at risk for having known previa or accreta, Jehovah's Witness, or iron deficiency anemia. And I really want to emphasize this part about care, counseling, and advanced planning for women with these kind of risk factors, because this can make a huge difference in their outcome if they do uh, bleed at birth. Then we also want to ensure that we have appropriate blood bank specimens on admission and quantify blood loss for all births so that we know what's going on and we're prepared for moving forward if necessary. Next. So the admission risk assessment. Um, hopefully this is familiar to many people and I just want to point out a few small changes that we made here. One is that we took BMI off of the risk list because the um, data on BMI as a hemorrhage risk was, was mixed in the studies at the time that we reviewed the information again. And then the other thing that we have clarified on the risk assessment is that there should be, uh, next slide, an ongoing assessment. So this isn't something that only happens at admission, but also happens during labor for the development of new risk factors, and also happens um, for women who may be at risk after delivery. So if they had a vacuum or forceps birth, if they had a cesarean birth, if they had retained placenta, that we want to be having a heightened um, index of suspicion for hemorrhage. Next. So then, um, as always in reviewing the literature, we, there, you know, you set a guideline or a, a set of recommendations and then there's questions that arise. And so one of the things that came up this time around was thinking about active management of the third stage um, and who are the best candidates for this, what about delayed cord clamping, um, are there any potential harms to active management? Next. So. Um, Okay, we can work with this. Um, we uh, used the Cochrane Review from 2011 to, as the primary source. We also reviewed a number of other sources uh, for active management recommendations. And basically, um, we can go to the next slide. The, the bottom line from the review of literature that we did on um, active management is that we really have not been able to identify that other components other than oxytocin are really contributing to the difference in breeding, bleeding risk in women who receive active management. And there may be some um, potential for harm in some of the other activities. So next. Even though we previously recommended a bundle sort of for active management with oxytocin infusion, cord clamping, controlled traction, vigorous massage, our assessment of the new data and recent systematic reviews is that there was a significant risk of bias in some of those studies. And um, next slide. We really think that oxytocin is the main component of active management. And so that's the only thing that has been sort of definitively confirmed among that old bundle of practices. So that's the recommendation is that you focus on the oxytocin administration. Um, and this is particularly true in our high resource settings in the United States. The other thing that we really think is important to clarify is that delayed cord clamping does not increase the risk for hemorrhage and active management should not inf interfere with the practice of delayed cord clamping for newborn benefit. So the recommendation is oxytocin 10 to 40 units um, uh, as an infusion titrated to uterine tone or 10 units IM when there's no IV access, so that's on the preventive side. Then if we're using oxytocin for treatment, which is also um, a drug of choice for treatment of hemorrhage, we want to have a rapid infusion uh, at over 500 mLs per hour, again, titrated to the patient's response. 
then we think that there isn't really a clear way to differentiate between the second line agents for uterotonics. So we think what's important there is that you choose a standard second line agent within your facility so that everyone knows which one we're going to use first and that it's you've worked out your system so the medication is, is easily available. So between methogen, misoprostol, and hemabate, we um, don't wait those. You should choose and just have a standardized approach. Next. So moving on, hopefully you've uh, either prevented or stopped the hemorrhage from happening, but some women will still continue to bleed. And so the stage one is really about um, if they're still bleeding, we want to activate the hemorrhage protocol and checklist. And really work to find a cause for the um, bleeding. Use a standard second line medication for atony and initiate our preparations. Getting help, um, putting in a 16 gauge IV and getting some labs. Think about putting in a Foley with a urimeter to measure urine output. Make sure she's typed and crossed and quant make sure that we're quantifying our blood loss. So this activation of our protocol and our hemorrhage um, activities is facilitated by having a standardized set of medications and um, supplies, as we mentioned earlier. So you want to have a hemorrhage cart that has, um, for L&D and postpartum, you also want to think about having an emergency hysterectomy set in your, in your OR um, to make sure that you have things available when they're needed and are not, you're not wrestling around trying to find things. Next. So this is an, a nice example of an OB hemorrhage cart from um, Long Beach Memorial. They have the stages of hemorrhage blown up nice and big so everyone can see them right on the top. They also have a binder which has all the protocol elements that somebody might need in a hurry. And um, I don't know if you can, how well you can see it at the bottom, there's a refrigerator on this cart. So they're able to keep their medications that need to be stored in a refrigerator right there with um, there are other supplies, and they've carefully labeled all the components and developed a process for checking uh, those components. And then they have, you know, the, there's a little basket on the side that has clipboards and all sorts of other things that you might need in the situation. Next. Can I get the next slide? So the main um, point is that we have lists in the toolkit of what we recommend you have in your obstetric hemorrhage cart, both for labor and delivery and for the operating room. So in the operating room, you might need a few extra things, including the um, diagrams of the B. Lynch technique and the modified B. Lynch technique, along with ensuring that you have um, all of the other supplies needed. So um, this is an overview of the, the checklist version of the protocol, and um, I am going to hand back to David at this point to talk about some of the aspects that we work on as a team here. Cool. So um, thanks, and I, I think uh, what you see uh, 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 as far as changes uh, or emphasis is, you know, the importance of not uh, delaying other uh, interventions while waiting for, uh, you know, responses to medication. In other words, kind of move along, and we're going to talk about some of those interventions in a minute as we get to uh, going down. Uh, and uh, also emphasizing that uh, transfusion of uh, blood, red blood cell uh, uh, being given is not dependent on lab results uh, and, and that obviously, and, and we mentioned this in the prep work, uh, making sure that it, if you have it uh, more quickly available that you utilize uh, O negative transfusions. Um, it, again, the idea is to reduce delay and denial. Next slide. The other thing that this sort of emphasizes is something that uh, was mentioned, uh, or that uh, Audrey mentioned about using the 16 gauge uh, um, needle is because, you know, if you think about the amount of uh, blood products and fluids you want to get in, you want to get those in rapidly and there's a huge difference, you know, a 20 gauge 
as you can see there, if it's just a gravity, it's only 65 cc's a minute. So you really need a 16 gauge, uh, you, you know, when bleedings happen, and of course, get that in before the vasoconstriction develops. Next slide. Um, we reemphasize the use of uh, balloons and, and uh, bead lengths or compression sutures. Uh, we, we have seen a number of reports across uh, hospitals uh, across the state that have, uh, you know, been more rapidly using the uh, uh, Bakri uh, balloons. Uh, we, we don't endorse any specific company, by the way. There are uh, now uh, double balloon catheters made by other companies and a number of things coming out. Uh, but we do suggest that, um, you, you, you know, the, that every institution have uh, these and have people trained up to them uh, so that they can rapidly uh, be put in. Next slide. Um, intrauterine balloons are good um, by, uh, for a number of clinical areas, such as a low-lying placenta where there's uh, the, the uh, lower uterine segment is poorly contracted because remember the lower uterine segment doesn't have as much uh, muscular uh, tissue. Uh, it's good for apnea, but it won't treat apnea in itself. So uh, again, it may be something to use in conjunction with tocolytics, excuse me, with uterotonics uh, as well. And then other areas, uh, special areas like accretas, uh, cervical pregnancy implantations, uh, uh, where you have uh, low clotting factors such as D DIC uh, and you want to slow down the bleeding. Uh, a reminder that these techniques can be used in conjunction with the B-Lynch sutures. In other words, you're using sort of a sandwich technique, the, the B-Lynch, to pull down the uncontracted fundus uh, against the lower, a dilated lower segment with the balloon in it or for vaginal sidewall lacerations. And then, like I say, these are not just to be used in abdominal approaches. These can be used vaginally. Next slide. Um, balloon is probably the first step. Uh, everybody agrees that this is probably the next step. And the reason for that, obviously, there's very uh, small downside risk to these things. Um, you can use uh, it as a so-called tamponade uh, test. In other words, uh, temporize things, see if it works, and that tells you uh, if you need to do other things such as uh, take the patient back and perform uh, and open the abdomen. Next slide. Um, there's lots of balloons out there, as I mentioned early. Uh, again, the, the Cook balloon is specifically designed. Um, probably, I would tell you, most units are not utilizing Foley catheters anymore. There's issues on how big you can get them, and, and they tend to be latex, as, as you know. Uh, and so uh, the Cook or the Ebb, which is the, the two, uh, two balloon catheter, um, you're beginning to see these, uh, you, you know, more prominent. The other thing I would just kind of a quick aside mention is that you can work with most of the reps of these uh, companies. They have models that will let you bring it in. So, for example, at a departmental meeting, you can, uh, you know, have the docs, uh, you know, practice or proficiency. And, and of course, they'll uh, help with the training and things of that nature. So, again, just having them available. Um, in general, uh, like I say, uh, we, we don't want to tell you what specifically to use, but I, but I think every every unit needs to have some of these. Thank, uh, next slide. Um, what have users given us feedback? Well, if you, you know, the, the recommendation is somewhere between 150, 500 cc's. Probably the middle, about most uteri, it's about 250, 300 cc's. Uh, if you're putting them in abdominally uh, at C-section, what you can kind of do sometimes is put lap pads in and get an estimate of what the volume is going to be while you're getting the, the balloon out and ready to go and filled up. 
and uh, then just fill it up to the same volume. Um, remember these, uh, especially where the cervix has been widely dilated, can sort of fall out, so to speak, into the vagina. So oftentimes vaginal packing is necessary, or as I mentioned earlier, the two balloon uh, catheters are set up to have a vaginal balloon that holds it in place. Next slide. Um, as well, we feel pretty strongly that everybody needs to, to have bead lens compression sutures available. Um, it's really a pretty simple technique. Uh, it's one of those things, obviously, if you only use it once or twice a year, that you kind of need a little uh, reminder. Uh, the B, B. Lynch developed his technique, the, the so-called belt and suspenders, uh, you, you know, where it's pretty simple. You go in and out above the fundus, in and out of the, the posterior lower segment, uh, come back up over the fundus, go in and out by the incision, and then tie that down. And you can see on this diagram where you can do that and then close the, the transverse incision separately from that. Uh, again, this is very good at a, a, a tonic uterus, and it works by the principle that uh, the uterine fiber, you know, like all muscle tissue, you can't over distend something to where the muscle fibers, uh, if you look microscopically, what it is is the actin and myosin uh, fibers just can't simply grab on because they're, they're past their limit. So, so anyway, the idea is that this uh, pulls it down. And again, uh, the idea, it, it works with uterotonics, with the medication to augment those. Next slide. Here's just a picture of what it looks like, uh, which rem reminds me to tell everybody, use absorbable suture for this technique. Um, uh, you can see those two big loops. Once the uterus shrinks back down to normal size, those would, if you used a permanent or, or a semi-permanent uh, form a suture that potentially could grab a loop of bowel or cause some problems. Next slide. So, like I say, we feel pretty strongly that every uh, person doing deliveries uh, needs to know how to do these. Um, they are quick and easy, uh, and uh, obviously at cesarean where you don't have to open the abdomen, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, and it can be combined with the balloon, as, as we said. Um, uh, next slide. Um, there is some data that's come along. Uh, this paper uh, that was published in the Green Journal in, in 2011 uh, divided up uh, when the B. Lynch sutures were placed, and you can see if, if the, and they looked at hysterectomy rates, if they were put in within an hour of delivery of the child, it was 16%. If they waited until you kind of got behind and things were going on, uh, it was 42%. So again, I would argue that this is another example of, uh, you know, the, the old principle of reducing delay and denial. Next slide. Um, stage three uh, is, uh, uh, defined as a blood loss greater than 1,500, and as, uh, and as Audrey uh, uh, quoted, uh, the, the, the sort of bottom line is still bleeding. In other words, if you get to 1,500 and you've stopped them successfully, you don't need to do a lot of the steps that are outlined in, in stage three. Um, uh, as we'll talk about, probably the trickiest part of the stage three for uh, version 2.0 was the question over um, uh, what uh, percentage of blood products uh, need to be, in other words, how many red blood cells versus uh, clotting factors uh, uh, should be given. Uh, we settled, uh, I would say, on this sort of um, common sense approach, and I'll explain in the, in the next few slides why we came up with that. Of giving, immediately giving two units of packed red blood cells, uh, and then following that, going to a one-to-one -one ratio of packed red blood cells to fresh frozen plasma. And then for every six, four to six units of red cells, uh, give a platelet count 
I mean, give a, a, a plasma a phoresis pack of, of platelets. Um, and, and that's really what we recommend as, as far as putting in your massive transfusion protocol. Turns out this is pretty similar to non-OB standards. And so that's the other uh, point that we wanted to kind of keep it in conjunction so there wasn't confusion on the part of the blood bank as to try to figure out a special uh, uh, obstetrical uh, massive transfusion protocol. Next slide. Um, all, that, all the emphasis on making sure you get blood uh, coagulation factors back in uh, is based upon uh, experience uh, in uh, sort of modern warfare. Do you want to look at that where they, they lowered mortality rates? Next slide. Um, and so again, I'm not going to reiterate this because we just went over this, uh, but uh, you know, what we're really trying to do is uh, rapid, or to avoid getting into uh, so-called non-surgical bleeding or coagulopathies, and so get, get the units going quickly and, and give the clotting factors. Uh, again, to reiterate, uh, we recommend transfusion not based on labs. Um, I think one of the things we found consistently in the mortality uh, reviews is people were waiting for laboratory results to come back before they transfused. And simply the amount of blood being lost and or obviously when you reach vital signs, uh, as Audrey went over, uh, dropping, that, that it's important. These guidelines are consistent with uh, the anesthesiologist uh, guidelines, so uh, it works out nice where you're more liable in your hospital to get agreement between OB and, and anesthesia. Next slide. Um, the other reminder is there's other problems with making coagulopathy simply uh, than just the blood loss itself. So avoiding delusional uh, coagulopathies, in other words, giving too much crystalloid, as happened in one of our uh, case examples, uh, is important. And same way, hypothermia. Uh, one of my favorite uh, blood bank people always ask people, well, if you stop and think about it, you go down to the blood bank, what, what, here's all the blood hanging in the refrigerators. You know why you hang it in the refrigerators? Because it avoids it clotting off. So uh, again, uh, just keep that in mind. You want to keep the patient warm. So using a bear hugger or other uh, and fluid warmers is a necessary part of your protocol. Next slide. Um, if if the patient gets profoundly uh, hypovolemic, then then distribution uh, to peripheral tissue goes down, and you end up with acidosis. And uh, again, uh, uh, acid uh, concentrations will uh, cause the clotting enzymes not to function properly. And if you let the patient get to this degree, then, then that's one of the reasons it's so difficult to reverse. And so uh, treating a metabolic acidosis and reversing this is an important part of your resuscitation. Next slide. And here again, this just reiterates uh, some of the stuff in stage three, and I won't go through it item by item. Um, but I will, uh, you know, again, put in a plug uh, for that. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to you, Audrey, to, to start on uh, QBL. All right. Can I have the next slide, please? So uh, quantification of blood loss, this is a CMQCC standard recommendation, and uh, we know that this is also an area that there's um, sometimes some uh, shall I say, conversation about whether it really needs to be done. And so we'll just review the background for why it's important to use quantification of blood loss, which is that um, there are a number of studies that have been done that show that we are very, very poor at estimating blood loss. And the most important piece of that is that we consistently underestimate large blood volumes. Um, and not only that, but um, even though it is possible to train people to be better at, at visually estimating blood, lo 
blood loss, that skill quickly deteriorates over time and it still really doesn't bring us to a, a place where we're good at estimating large blood volumes just visually. And this is not related to provider experience in the studies that have been done. On top of all of that, um, every case that reviewed in the California Review of Maternal Death uh, that was related to hemorrhage, there was a significant underestimation of blood loss in the initial phases that makes it harder to take quick action and recover. Next, please. Yeah, so the other issues that we have seen are that um, if we don't recognize the actual volume of blood loss, it's easier for people to sort of remain in denial that there's a serious problem and denial leads to delay and delay leads to poor outcomes for women. So um, if it's not a routine measuring our blood loss, then we won't know how to do it when things are really going crazy. So it's really important for it to be easy for people to do and something that they're very familiar with and is just part of routine practice because then they will be ahead of, sort of ahead in terms of being able to recognize that something is awry and, and we need to, to move into the hemorrhage protocol. If people aren't familiar with it, they might not even know that they need to be using it until we're quite fire in the hole. Next slide, please. So a couple of things have come up over the years that we've uh, had this recommendation now, which is it seems to be that there's something about moving to measurement as opposed to visual estimation that people get very concerned with having a perfect measurement. And as of today, we don't yet have a perfect measurement. So there are some technologies in development that may um, solve some of these issues for us, but it's important for the team to understand that the goal is not to get a perfect, precise number. It's to get a much better number than we had before. So there are still going to be problems of amniotic fluid contamination or urine or um, blood clot that gets mixed in with other fluid in the drapes. Um, so what we have to do about that is we have to do our best. It doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect. Using QBL increases our knowledge of blood loss and is, is indeed more accurate than EBL. So when patients have a hemorrhage doing QBL, when it becomes second nature for the team, it improves their recognition that a patient is hemorrhaging, it improves their ability to move along the pathway towards additional interventions. So it's helpful if this is how we do it here in a positive sense. Um, and can help us uh, reduce delays in responding to hemorrhage. Next slide, please. So um, hopefully many of you are familiar with the graduated underbuttock drape. This was something that um, came out uh, since the initiation of, a, of the first toolkit. Um, and I will never forget the look on people's faces when they saw how much blood volume can be in the bottom of one of those drapes in, in a sense that we didn't really think about being a lot of blood. But it really can accumulate a lot of blood in the drapes. And so these, many of the facilities that have been successful in implementing QBL have done a lot of work with um, practicing showing people what different volumes of blood look like and getting them to try estimating it so that they can get some feedback on their own accuracy and this sort of helps um, build um, consensus toward the need to do actual measurement. So at vaginal birth, what we want to do is um, try to take a pause at the birth and see what's in the bag because um, once, when the baby's born but before the placenta has, has come, we want to note what's there because that may be other things and then the blood comes after. So a lot of people have done this sort of two-step process in terms of being able to get accurate uh, vaginal uh, blood in the, in the graduated container. You also do have to get people not to dump a bunch of other stuff in there. So it usually requires having a separate place to put other things that you don't want going in the bag. Also, a lot of people have used standardized kits so that they have everything together and easy to do their measurements with. Um, next slide, please. QBL at Caesarean has been um, a little bit more challenging for some facilities, but um, typically if you make it a quick um, two-step process, this can go very straightforwardly. 
Um, if you use your team to practice how it works in your, in your OR with your team before you try to implement it. It's very helpful to have a calculator and make it easy, build this into the electronic medical record so that you don't have people having to do a bunch of um, calculations in a situation where they have patient care that they need to prioritize. So if you start with one or two cases and one or two physician champions, use small tests of change to work out your process for your facility, then you can stage moving it to all your scheduled cases and add unscheduled cases. And we've had several people tell us that um, once they started doing this in the operating room with their C-sections, uh, it actually spread to other areas of the hospital because people got wind of it and liked how it was going. So people started using it in their GYN cases and other surgical cases as well. Next slide, please. This is an example, again, from Long Beach Memorial of having a, a posted list of how to go about doing a, a quantification of blood loss at cesarean. So if you um, <clears throat> suction blood between delivery of insulin and placenta and suction the drape of amniotic fluid, then the scrub staff can direct the circulator to change the suction tubing to a second canister. Um, and if there isn't really a lot of amniotic fluid, then you can skip that step. The circulator records the volume in the second canister in the spreadsheet. Um, and they have, at Long Beach, they've changed how they use irrigation to accommodate the, um, the uh, measurement of blood loss as well. So they often now aren't even using irrigation during routine cases because it makes for another step that they need to think about. Um, and I'm going to show you in a minute some pictures of what they're doing in terms of nice, clean ways of weighing the, the laps and the blood from that. And then um, there are a number of facilities now that have built spreadsheets or calculators or EPIC calculators or other um, EMR systems building those calculators into their setting to make it easy for people to quantify the blood loss. Next, please. So here's an example of, you know, the multiple suction containers that you can just switch the which one you're using for which activity. And then on the right-hand side, pretty much these days, hopefully everyone's using their lap counting envelopes. And then in the next slide, you can just wrap that up and weigh it on the scale. And if you have your um, dry weights and known quantities of your supplies, then that can all be um, built into your calculator for you. Next slide, please. So this is an example of a, the build from Long Beach where um, they have the different, just a click for how many laps were used, and they can add their different pieces in to get their, uh, the math taken care of. Next slide. So the other thing that has become really sort of known already, but really has been emphasized by our end users is the importance of running drills. And as Paul Preston has said, medicine is the last high-risk industry that expects people to perform perfectly in a complex rare emergencies, but does not support them with high-quality training and practice. Hopefully this is changing some um, because we are using so much more simulation throughout hospitals today. But it's really important that the routine practice goes on and that we do drills for how to respond to hemorrhage. Next slide. So um, just to bring this back a little bit to um, why we do it, <laughs> it's that uh, patients are at the center of this whole situation. And so I, I want to raise this um, in terms of thinking about we have so much to do in terms of addressing hemorrhage and responding to hemorrhage, but we also really need to remember that the patient is having a traumatic experience most likely at that point in time, and we need to make sure to provide support for her and her family. And we do have a whole section in the toolkit about patient and family support. So Melissa um, Price is a woman who had a late postpartum hemorrhage and served on the hemorrhage task force this time around and um, remembers asking the nurses how they could tell how much blood she was losing. She noticed as a patient that they never weighed the blood and they were dumping it from a bedpan into a portable toilet. So this point, just to remember that some of the things that we have advised people to do in the toolkit actually are also reassuring to patients when they feel like we know what's going on and, and um, we can effectively communicate the amount of blood that's being lost. 
She also talks about her feeling of sheer panic when the bleeding started again, that she was having enormous clots. I screamed, I will never forget the look on the nurse's face when she lifted up that blanket. I just kept thinking, God, give them more time. They need more time to save me. So we have more of Melissa's story in the toolkit. She did end up with a hysterectomy and about 12 units of blood transfused. Um, and just to remember how important that patient support is, even though it's one of the reasons why we need to have an effective practiced team responding to hemorrhage is that so someone can be designated to provide support for the patient and their family. Next slide. So the other thing that we've heard from end users quite a bit is that, you know, OB hemorrhage is a prototypic OB emergency, but many of the system changes are directly applicable to other OB emergencies, and in fact, some of the system changes that people have put in in their OB units, they've given us examples of how they've spread this throughout the hospital. Um, so, although it takes a lot of work to implement the full, every aspect of the hemorrhage bundle, there are a lot of benefits to be gained in terms of team performance and ability to respond, and these will not be, these are likely not to be limited just to situations where women are hemorrhaging. You are likely to see the performance improvements spread to other areas as well. Some examples on the next slide. Kaiser Roseville said, we have learned that through debriefing, we talk about problems, and by talking about problems, not only can we find solutions, we can change outcomes. From Salinas Valley Memorial, it's not just hemorrhage that we address here. We're trying to make L&D safer for moms and babies. As a result of processes we put in place, all births are safer. Next slide. So reminding you also that the, this is all part of the National Partnership for Maternal Safety, um, and there are some standardizations coming out of that national partnership. In terms of um, data collection, they will be looking at the number of blood products per thousand mothers and the number of women receiving more than four units of PRBCs, and this is one of the ways that you can, can track um, Performance, it's important that our performance measures don't discourage early and appropriate transfusion because we want to emphasize the recognition um, and treatment when needed. Next slide. So there is a business case for implementing the um, massive transfusion protocol and the overall emergency management plan, which is that blood products are extremely expensive and hemabate is also extremely expensive. And some of the other things that we might go to for uh, serious hemorrhage are very, very expensive. So the theory behind what we're doing here is that if we can prevent the progression of a, a class one or a stage one hemorrhage to a, a massive hemorrhage, we will actually end up, even though we might give more small volumes of blood in stage two, we may um, be able to reduce the number of massive transfusions that we need to give and reduce the number of other expensive high-level interventions that need to happen. We have now on the next slide a number of facilities that have demonstrated significant improvements. Saddleback Memorial has shown a reduction in hysterectomy with increased use of B-Lint suture. California Pacific Medical Center has a substantial reduction in blood product usage with the protocol. And Dignity Health has published their substantial reductions in overall blood product usage with um, standardizing the protocol throughout their many facilities. Indiana University, the last data that we had from them, they had shown a 33% reduction in postpartum hemorrhage over 10 quarters with implementation of the protocol. So with that, I'm going to hand back to David to um, do a little wrap-up and summary, and then we'll take some questions. So uh, some of the key points, uh, Audrey mentioned about uh, how we are now focusing, instead of full active management uh, of the third stage on oxytocin administration. Um, second, and we probably uh, Glaze uh, uh, went by this one when, it, when the slide came up, but it's, uh, we did find data on sublingual uh, mesoprostol. Uh, so in, if you look at in, in the stage two recommendations, it's now uh, injectable uh, F2 alpha or uh, uh, 800 micrograms of mesoprostol given sublingually. Um, 
a number of people have reported that trying to give it vaginally, of course, it gets washed out or rectally, uh, gets pushed out. So this is uh, one there uh, for uh, a new addition. Uh, we did, uh, as I uh, mentioned, uh, tweak the transfusion recommendations so that you get the two immediate units of pack red blood cells and then go to your near equal uh, uh, near equal administration of blood cells and fresh frozen plasma, as well as the other measures we mentioned, including uh, calcium electrolytes, making sure you don't get acidotic hypothermia uh, and or dilution. Um, we also put in some resources for uh, both the moms and their families. Um, obviously, these are events, uh, as I think you heard by Melissa's story, uh, that can affect people in, in a major way. And so I think addressing that is, is a good thing, and, and that's why uh, we have that. And then as well, some resources for some of the support staff and, and things of that nature. Next slide. We can do better. Uh, you know, most uh, maternal mortalities and near misses are preventable. And uh, again, I would go back to our maternal mortality data to suggest that, and I, I think if you did a similar analysis on those folks going to the ICU or having things and you really analyze it, we can do better. Our, while we fully support risk factor screening so you can get prepared for high-risk cases, remember about a third of patients will not have a risk factor, and so you have to be ready for everybody. And as well, um, we are reemphasizing the utilization of QBL uh, uh, to, to arrive at cumulative blood loss. Uh, as, as Audrey mentioned, it's not perfect, but it's the best we can do right now. And, and if you look at the, at the stepwise protocol and you understand that we can't use lab values and we can't use vital signs uh, to guide our, our movement along the pathway because it goes so quick, then, then this becomes the primary uh, way to uh, push forward. Um, th remember, this is one of those things where a team-based approach is, is not only nice to have, it's an absolute. And uh, we continue to, to push forward on that. Next slide. So I think as you're preparing, you ask yourselves, do we have all the resources? What do we need to develop? Uh, what team members need uh, teaching and uh, drilling and, and things of that nature? Uh, do we as an institution and, and as providers uh, recognize the triggers that are there? In other words, we're not waiting for, for vital signs to, to uh, uh, change. We're, we're being more proactive. And um, also, and this is, of course, part of a general uh, culture of safety, and that is we empower the team's uh, members to activate protocols and not have to wait for phone calls and uh, things of that nature to intervene prop properly. So that means for those of you on electronic records, uh, building into your order sets uh, conditional orders that allow people to respond in a more timely fashion. And then when we get into the response, it's this sequential utilization patient monitoring, evaluation, uh, a aggressive early therapy, uh, including transfusion, uh, to uh, push forward and really reduce the chances that that patient gets critical. Next slide. Um, a number of wonderful people have worked on this toolkit, and I put them up here. Uh, notice Audrey's name goes first, and that's because she did all the hard work. I just took a lot of the credit. Um, but there were a whole lot of other folks uh, from wide disciplines, and again, I'm not going to read everybody's name, but I do want to recognize them, and they will uh, be in the toolkits. Next slide. And then Nancy and, and her team, Nancy Peterson and her team, that really helped organize the phone calls that I uh, did all the work uh, working uh, with the appropriate uh, state folks who did their uh, due diligence and carefully uh, reviewed our work to get it out there. 
And, and then the last thing I'll say is I, I think, and, and again, I'm shooting from the hip, Bauer, you probably know the precise numbers, uh, but my last understanding of Christine's numbers is that we're now above uh, 1,500 downloads of the toolkit already. Uh, it's gone to, it's, it's really had a worldwide uh, distribution, and I, I, again, applaud all the people that have helped work on this. Um, Toolkits like OB Hemorrhage are best done by teams, not individuals. So with that, I think we'll stop, and Audrey will be happy to take all the difficult questions, and uh, for those of you with real easy questions, I'll be happy to jump in on those. Thank you. Thank Thank you, David and Audrey. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, we're up to almost 2,000 downloads of the Hemorrhage Toolkit since March 24th, so that's really great. Um, I wanted to go over a little bit of housekeeping and answer a little bit of the questions that I could first. The um, meeting has been recorded, and um, the link for the meeting will be posted on the CMQCC website. The slides will also be available. Um, and for those of you who um, are joining the call and requesting a CE, you will be receiving um, an email from uh, CMQCC about getting that CE for attendance. And if you were in a group, and um, all of you in the group and you're listening together in one meeting room want to um, get a CE individually, you can email Julie Vasher. Um, at jvasher at stanford.edu or Sanary Lou and her email he, her email is slu l o u at stanford.edu and of course my um, email is up on the screen if you have any questions you can email me us also um, I wanted to go through some of the questions because they had been addressed by Audrey and David um, the uterine volume was 5,000 the um, correct for sublingual misoprostol was 800 micrograms. And um, there were a few other questions that I will just throw out to David and Audrey. Right. Um, is there a consistent protocol as far as how much Pitocin over what time frame depending on gravity, such as 600 cchr of 20 units in one liter, then 125 cchr for multip or 300 cchr times one hour for a primip? Our nurses vary. Some open the 30 micro at 500 bag wide. Right. If we had um, the ability from the literature to provide you with a concrete recommendation there, we would we would do it. But unfortunately, the studies on oxytocin um, are not consistent in terms of the dosing, and they're not consistent in terms of uh, whether or not they actually report the rate at which the infusion was given. Um, so we do have one of the other things I wanted to point out, especially for the, if we don't get to your question today on the call, um, the toolkit itself is quite long, but it has um, a background section for each of the recommendations that we make that goes over a brief review of the literature for each of the recommendations and basically explains our rationale for why we've said what we've said. And so that can be a, quite a helpful resource in terms of some of these questions. And I believe that in the oxytocin or the, the uterotonic medication section, we actually stated that in the in the write up that you know there isn't a clear recommendation to make about what the rate should be. So that's why it's a 10 to 40 units <laughs> in a liter or whatever, however you want to do that. Um, if we could pin that down, we would, but it's just not clear. It yes, is clear uh, that oxytocin Audrey, works. Audrey, thanks for taking the tough part. Um, the, the other thing I would say, and, and this uh, particular question is indicative of a, a number of things that was frustrating to us and that we couldn't find a specific well-designed study that had proven this. So I think for those of you from academic institutions are looking for, there, there's still within the whole realm of OB hemorrhage a huge number of clinical trials that need to be run and, and uh, you know, clarified, and this is an obvious good example. Thank you. The next question is, if your patient has no prenatal care, is she automatically a type and screen, or where would she fit into the risk assessment? Um, 
prenatal care or lack of prenatal care is not listed as a risk factor, and I'm not aware of any literature that would suggest that just the presence or absence of prenatal care would affect hemorrhage risk. So I think like with most things, that has to be a careful assessment of a patient who comes in with no prenatal care to determine what her history is and whether or not she has factors that might put her at higher risk for hemorrhage. Okay. Um, one of the other questions was about the accuracy of the drape and versus the difference between the cylinder measurement and maybe it would might be different than what the drape said and what has the experience been? I think people, if people want to test that using the products that they're using at their facility, they could test that. Um, again, I would emphasize that the point of this is to get better than we were but I, none of us are suggesting that we have a perfect measurement. Hopefully some of the new technology that's coming out, there's a number of new technologies in development that we're starting to see that are, you know, using various different ways of um, picking up how much blood is, is in a piece of material or a container. Yeah, the, next the only thing I would add to that, Valerie, is that uh, you know, uh, this is a pretty rapidly developing area of, of tools. Um, if you think about it, when we released uh, version 1.0, we didn't have the under buttock drapes, uh, which now are, are becoming very commonplace to have the graduated drapes. So I, I think the bottom line is, uh, I agree with Audrey, I think, I think we'll get better tools. Uh, but right now the important thing is to, to be attempting and using some of some of the tools that are available because they're so much better than, uh, you know, have, uh, how we used to do. And the, the other point to be made about QBL versus EBLs is remember when we had EBLs, we had, a, we, we had uh, the anesthesiologist had one, the OB had one, and the uh, nurses uh, knew the real numbers. So the, the bottom line on that is you, you had dueling numbers and it's very hard to respond on that. At least with QBL, it forces you to do this methodology as, as a team. Okay, the next question is that there's a cost um, of blood that is not used. When is it safe to release the blood um, you have on hold for active bleeds? Well, that, you know, that sort of varies institution to institution. That's one thing you want to work very closely with your blood bank. Um, there are products now where they can put blood up into a refrigerator uh, in the, near the uh, uh, C-section room or the delivery unit and then still not have the blood, uh, you know, uh, in other words, it still can be taken down, back down and available. Um, that's something I would recommend working really closely with your blood bank to try to find out the best solution. So, Audrey, anything you want to add? Uh, no, I think I think working with the blood bank and then um, there's also always the judgment of this specific situation. Yeah, if, if, as far as cost effectiveness goes, the, the bottom line by avoiding a coagulopathy and having someone get 50 or 75 units of blood products um, you're saving a whole lot of money, a lot of money. So being more aggressive and timely, uh, what, that's kind of what most institutions have found, that they're uh, perhaps given another unit or two or wasting another unit or two, but what they avoid is, is the really big hemorrhage. So we have about four more questions. I'm going to combine two of them. What can you suggest for physicians that order for no fundal rubs postpartum, and do you recommend radiological embolization versus balloon? <laughs> and then I have two more questions after that. I, I'm going to take that one re real well. First of all, unfortunately, this being recorded, so I can't really say what I want to do with those physicians. But I, I think this is why it's appropriate to have an institutional guidelines where everybody does the same thing. Um, what I always tell the docs, you don't want to get creative on this any more than you would in a code blue, uh, you know, get creative about what medications at what times for what 
responses. This is something. This is an emergency, you know, response. And again, you're working as a team, and it's important not to have variation uh, with e any of the particular protocols. So I think I think that's critical. And and now that I said that, Valerie, what was the second part? Oh, balloons versus. Yeah, I, I think intervention. The reality is those are not mutually exclusive. First of all, um, balloons are obviously quick, e easy, and can be done, you know, right on the unit. In general, most radiology departments either don't have someone who's skilled in this, or second, um, have somebody, you know, 24/7 sitting, uh, you know, ready to do this. This is something that you know, you kind of have to prepare for. And what we found by our review of this is there just aren't that many hospitals that are utilizing this, and this that's why there's not a lot of um, information in the toolkit about that. Okay. Uh, how long do you recommend oxytocin infusion be continued after delivery? Again, there's not a lot of good data on that. Okay. And the we next wish there question was. Is, <laughs> the next question is, how do you reconcile what you are recommending with the findings from HCA that implemented this but found no improvement in mortality due to hemorrhage? So I would say that mortality is a relatively rare outcome and you need large numbers to be able to demonstrate that. Um, so the other outcome to look at is severe morbidity, which is 50 times more, more com or more, there's 50, 50 times more severe morbidities than there are mortalities. So that affects a lot of women. We also have data from a number of other settings that um, do show improvements in uh, some of these outcomes. So in terms of what we consider severe morbidity, like hysterectomy. Um, so it's hard to say what the degree of the implementation was. There's a lot going on in implementation science about how do we evaluate implementation um, in, in different settings, and this is really an area for continued study and continued learning. But we do have a lot of facilities telling us that they um, are sure they're saving patients from working on this teamwork aspect and the aspects of the protocol, and we do have uh, systems like Dignity that are showing um, improvement in patient outcomes. Yeah, I, I, I would tag on to that. I agree there needs to be more study. I, you know, with respect to the HCA data, remember that's a huge uh, system and, and how well they could implement and how, how uh, everybody was using uh, these tools. Um, I, you know, again, I, I think there, you know, obviously, as as you know, one study doesn't determine anything absolutely, and, and it's certainly an area where, uh, uh, you, you know, more research needs to validate what's effective or not. I mean, uh, for example, the active management data. Um, ha having said that, I think when you have a condition, that 95% of the time when you look at mortality, you realize something could have been done. It, it just makes sense that by doing something different, you're, you, you can make some improvement. But again, uh, you know, uh, the scientific literature is what it is. Uh, one study says one thing, one study says another. Um, the only thing I'll end with is I've started eating eggs again, uh, despite <laughs> my family history. Thank you, David and Audrey, for answering questions. Um, if you put a question in the, in, in the chat box and we did not address it, um, I've captured that and we will get back to you offline. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us for this presentation. And again, we are recording it. We will um, have the materials available for you. And there's another presentation on May 27th that will cover the exact same material. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. And with that, we'll sign off here at CMQCC. Thank you so much. Bye.